Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar from Q Control on quantum sensing with cold atoms. I'm Michael Hush. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer here at Q Control, and today I have with me uh, Stuart, who will introduce himself. Uh, hi, all. I'm Stuart Segetti. I'm the Principal Quantum Sensing Engineer at Q Control. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And also, Russ. Good morning, folks. I am Russell Anderson, a lead quantum atomic devices. Great to be here. So, uh, today we just start. I'm going to release a poll to get to know everyone better. Uh, so if you, the poll should be in front of you now. Um, if you wouldn't mind just filling it out and letting us know a little bit about yourself, we'd love to hear from you. Um, otherwise, uh, for this webinar, we're going to be presenting in two parts and give you an introduction to how quantum sensing with cold atoms can help improve the measurement of gravitational fields, accelerations, and magnetic fields, and then give you an understanding of how that you know additional precision in your measurements can be used to really change very important applications with everything from mining to space to terrestrial applications. So uh, today we're going to, at any point, if you have a question, you're welcome to use the Q&A function. Please don't put it in the chat, just hit that Q&A button. Um, and we'll be addressing any questions that you have uh, after the end of each part of the talk. Um, at the end, once you leave, you'll be given a survey. We would really appreciate if you fill that out. So um, it helps us make, make better webinars and also it puts you into a draw for a $50 Amazon gift card, which is you know, a great use of your time. And finally, um, if anything comes up at all during this that you'd like to talk about us more, um, please, there will be additionally an, another link which comes through. Um, you can set up a call with any, any of us to have a chat about what your questions are or how the products that we provide here at Q Control can help your control needs. So let's have a look at, oh, I didn't launch the poll. Fantastic. It's off to a good start. So I'll just launch the poll now. Um, the presentation is going to be done in two parts. So the first part will be on quantum sensing for real world applications, which will be presented by Stuart Zagetti. And then the second part will be on making quantum sensors useful in the field uh, using control, and that'll be presented by Russ. Um, so I'll just give you a few more minutes to fill out the presentation, uh, fill out the, the poll. Um, so yeah, we will, uh, just to be clear again, um, we'll probably be doing about five to 10 minutes at the end of each talk. So we'll have plenty of time for questions um, and we won't go over time, I think. Okay, let's have a quick end of that poll. Now that questions are coming in. So just getting oh, a few more to come. Okay, let's just get a quick little cut through. So yeah, it seems like we've got a lot of researchers here today, um, as always, and I just want to really highlight that um, we can really provide a, our tools that we provide here at Q-Control are very flexible and can help with a variety of different NGI research needs. Um, and yes, there's a lot of people who are interested in quantum sensing and potentially new to it. So hopefully we'll be able to teach you a lot today. Um, and then finally, yeah, there are people with and without access. Um, yeah, so a lot of the work that we're going to talk about um, can be used to like you get a huge benefit if you have access to hardware and you can do improvements yourself. But also I want to highlight that all the tools that we're presenting are also really good for analysis. So even if you don't have access to hardware, but you want to analyze some type of quantum sensing problem, um, you'll get an advantage. Okay, so um, after that introduction, let's let's get started. Welcome to Q-Control's presentation on quantum sensing with cold atoms. In the first part of this webinar, we will show you the advantages quantum atomic sensors have over conventional sensors and the benefits this will bring to real world applications. Q-Control's core offering has been delivering state-of-the-art quantum control solutions through software to improve the performance of quantum technology. We've now expanded our interest to apply the same quantum control methods to quantum sensing. Q-Control has the world's largest team of quantum control engineers and an expert quantum sensing team that includes theoretical and experimental quantum sensing specialists with demonstrated track records from world leading laboratories. Our quantum professional services team and control infrastructure software are here to help you get the very most out of your quantum sensing hardware through the power of quantum control. In addition to our professional services and infrastructure software, Q-Control has recently expanded into the development of quantum sensor hardware specifically tailored to take advantage of our quantum control solutions. q 
Q-Control's quantum control defined quantum sensors will offer improved sensitivity and stability in a small form factor, enabling new capabilities in multi-billion dollar markets. We have partnered with world leaders in sensing and space and are actively developing quantum sensors for precision navigation, persistent earth observation and space exploration. These partnerships are underpinned by key funding from Australian Defence, the Australian government's modern manufacturing initiative and the Moon to Mars Supply Chain Facilitation Program. Before discussing the first two applications in some detail, let's establish the benefits of quantum atomic sensors. Quantum systems are extremely sensitive to small changes in their environment, and the atoms used in quantum sensing are no exception. The rich internal structure of an atom can change a minuscule but measurable amount when the movement of a nearby subway train, for instance, causes a small change in magnetic field. This sensitivity, which is a challenge to overcome for many quantum technologies such as quantum computing, is exactly what is needed for a precision sensor and allows quantum atomic sensors to detect very small changes in accelerations, rotations, gravity, and electromagnetic fields. Additionally, quantum sensors can operate accurately for extremely long durations without external recalibration, often more than a factor of 100 times longer than conventional classical sensors. The measurement signal of a quantum sensor ultimately depends on fundamental physical constants that do not change over time, exploiting the fact that all atoms of a given species are identical. That is, a rubidium atom in Sydney is the same as a rubidium atom in LA or even on Mars. Contrast this to a spring-based sensor, for instance, which is based on an imperfectly machined physical artifact that suffers from calibration drifts due to temperature variations and material fatigue. This means that quantum sensors provide not just sensitive measurements, but also the long-term stability that is simply impossible to achieve with existing sensing technology. This sensitivity and stability is key to the superior measurement accuracy and precision enabled by quantum sensors. We now turn to the first real world application of quantum atomic sensors we will discuss in this webinar, precision navigation without GPS, which is also called dead reckoning. Global positioning based on timing signals sent from the ground to constellations of satellites enables accurate navigation on land, in the sea and in the air. Its use is ubiquitous and impacts far more than your daily commute. Accurate positioning and navigation via GPS is crucial for critical infrastructure and services, impacting emergency first responders, just-in-time logistics and freight, aviation, and our defense forces. The economic benefit to just the private sector is estimated at more than $1 trillion over the last 10 years. However, society's reliance on GPS is a vulnerability. GPS can be disrupted through electronic countermeasures, solar weather, or even missile attack. A recent report estimates that a five-day GPS outage in the UK would cost more than £5 billion. There is therefore significant interest in guarding against this vulnerability by developing accurate navigation systems that do not rely on GPS. This would provide far more than redundancy, since it would also allow navigation in situations where GPS cannot be accessed, such as underwater, in certain built-up urban environments, and deep space. Grasping this opportunity for accurate navigation without GPS is only possible through the ultra high stability uniquely offered by quantum sensors. To understand the key limitation lifted by quantum sensors, we must first understand why GPS is critical to our current navigation systems. In principle, it is possible to track the movement of a body by continuously measuring how it accelerates and rotates through a procedure called inertial navigation. In practice, Calibration drifts in the accelerometers and gyroscopes result in a rapidly growing error in positioning, which limits accurate unaided inertial navigation to between minutes and hours. An external reference is required to correct the errors caused by calibration drifts, and this is typically provided by GPS. Due to the unparalleled long-term stability of quantum atomic sensors, they can provide absolute measurements that can correct the calibration drifts of the classical inertial navigation system effectively replacing the recalibration role GPS was playing. This is quantum augmented inertial navigation and in collaboration with leading navigation partner, Advanced Navigation, Q-Control is developing the quantum sensing technology needed to make GPS-free navigation a reality. Modeling suggests that the quantum augmented navigation system we are developing, based on a fusion of classical accelerometers and gyroscopes with quantum sensors, can give more than 100 times performance gain compared with an inertial navigation system based solely on classical sensors. Our modeling also suggests that sophisticated quantum control solutions will be absolutely essential for completely realizing these performance gains. 
or indeed the predicted performance gains in any quantum classical sensor fusion application. Our quantum professional services team and infrastructure software are, are available to help you extract more and more useful information from your fused quantum classical sensor. So please get in touch if this is of interest to you. The second application we will discuss today is persistent Earth observation from space. The Earth's gravitational and magnetic fields are not uniform. They are different at different locations on the Earth and vary in time. Creating accurate gravity and magnetic maps directly impacts fundamental geophysics and climate science. Space-based surveys that map changes and variations to the Earth's gravitational field provide information about the global movement of water, which is vital for monitoring ocean currents, aquifer depletion, and ice sheet changes. Space-based geomagnetic surveys are used to understand fluid flow within the Earth's outer core and predict space weather. Unfortunately, these surveys require high-cost satellite missions that are planned and executed over decadal timescales, yet only last a few years. For instance, the European Space Agency's Gotcha Gravity Survey mission, which is pictured here, cost 350 million euros and lasted just four and a half years. The improved measurement precision and accuracy enabled by the long-term stability of quantum atomic sensors presents an opportunity to reduce the overall size of the sensor payload, enabling persistent surveillance with lower cost, smaller satellites. Additionally, quantum sensors could improve both the spatial and temporal resolution of these space-based surveys, a pressing need across many application areas. Improved gravity field spatial resolution, for instance, would allow for the monitoring of smaller river basins, the detection of weaker earthquakes, or even remote mineral prospecting from space. Again, the ultra high stability of quantum sensors is key to improving remote sensing performance. The resolution of current surveys is limited by calibration drifts in the satellite's onboard sensors, which are caused by uncontrollable vibrations and temperature variations. As we have previously discussed, quantum atomic sensors are inherently robust to these calibration drifts. This considerably improves the accuracy and precision of the onboard sensors, directly translating to improved survey spatial resolution with smaller sensor form factors and payloads. With quantum sensors, we therefore have the opportunity to develop a new set of eyes on the Earth. And again, sophisticated quantum control will be, will be needed to see most clearly with these eyes. This brings us to the end of part one of this webinar. We have seen how quantum atomic sensors provide sensitive measurements and long-term stability unachievable with conventional sensors, and how this unlocks new capabilities in navigation and persistent Earth observation. If you are interested in knowing more about how quantum sensors directly impact these two applications, or indeed any other real application, and there are many others we have not discussed here, please get in contact with one of our team members. Right. Welcome back. Um, so that's the end of that side of the presentation. Hello, Stuart. Hello. So we have um, a few questions that have come up. So the first one is, uh, and if you have any questions right now, please hit the Q&A button. Um, that question disappeared. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, the other question, which is the one that's coming up next is, um, uh, where did that factor of 100 come from in the improvement of the sensitivity? Could you describe precisely uh, which aspects give that full factor? Oh, that's a great question, uh, whoever asked that. So it comes from a range of factors that affect a quantum sensor's uh, sensitivity and stability. So uh, using control, we can uh, get more atoms to do more useful uh, work during your quantum sensor. So that gives you an additional factor of three. We can actually boost the signal when operating in a noisy environment, which gives you a factor of 10. And we can also have the, the atoms interrogated for a longer duration during the interferometer, which gives you the additional factor of five to 10 again, taking you up to about hundred or so. Uh, got the next one here. So what, what quantum sensors exist already? Um, that's, that's also a good question. So, How many good questions? <laughs> <Doing well. Yeah. laughs> no. so uh, quantum atomic sensors are predominantly lab-based devices that exist all around the world right now. However, they also exist on a range of platforms. They have been deployed um, on trucks, on ships, on planes, or even on a sounding rocket. As yet, they do not exist in space, but we're working hard to address that. Yeah. It has some um, uh, yep, go for it. evidence that 
we can get uh, the cold atom sensors that we're interested in deploying in space. Indeed, uh, people have made Bose Einstein condensates on the International Space Station. Uh, and there's, there's great promise in um, getting these performance gains to use uh, quantum sensors in space. That's right. I think they, I think they have plans to actually do a, an atom interferometry, a quantum sensing experiment on the ISS. Uh, I'm just not sure how those are progressing right now. Yeah. Um, I have another question for, uh, maybe this is best for Russ. Are you holding your atoms in a lattice for your sensor? Uh, we're looking at all sorts of cold atom sensing um, platforms and uh, methodologies. Our uh, first hardware won't be using um, lattices per se, but that's um, uh, certainly guiding and other types of confinement uh, are things that you can leverage to get particular um, advantages in different domains. Uh, the next question is, is Q control partnering with the ESA? Maybe that's a good question for Stuart. Uh, at the moment, we are not partnering with the ESA, but of course we are always willing to help out. Um, if anyone from the ESA is here and they want to see how control can actually help their sensors, please get in touch. Yep, absolutely. Um, so another one we have is many of the inertial platforms have been developed to be mechanically tough in high stock vibration environments albeit with a loss of precision. Um, how do these quantum sensors compare? Uh, maybe for you, Stuart. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Sorry. No problem. Many of these inertial platforms have been developed to be mechanically tough and high shock variation environments. So I think you're talking about inertial sensors, um, like space launch or munitions, um, with a loss, but there is a, uh, uh, it results in a loss of precision. So how do these quantum sensors compare to that kind of uh, situation? Uh, well, actually, this is, this is a, a good question that will hopefully be addressed partially by Russ uh, mm -hmm. in the second half of his talk. Uh, I guess the, the, the short version is, yes, uh, platform, platform noise associated with real world operation does degrade performance of quantum sensors and uh, control is the answer to mitigate that. You're about to hear that uh, as we speak. Great question. Yeah, we've got a, <laughs> got a lot of building for the next part, which is excellent. So um, well, I'll do two more questions before we move on to the final part. So uh, presumably one of the applications of quantum sensing would be more precise, accurate, and reliable um, in detecting mineral deposits, et cetera, here and other planets and asteroids. What do you, um, so is, do, you, do you agree with that, Stuart? Um, yes, absolutely. This is, uh, I think this is part of the goal for our moon to Mars uh, contract. Uh, we're looking at how quantum sensors could help detect mineral deposits on Earth and also uh, on Mars potentially. And by mineral deposits, we're also thinking of water. Um, yeah, so there's great, there's uh, great um, uh, examples to take from what we've learned about the Earth using terrestrial and um, mm -hmm. low Earth orbit observations of gravitational anomalies uh, from mineral prospecting with squids um, to looking at uh, gravitational anomalies to determine um, weather and water distribution, there's no reason to think that we can't learn the same thing about um, asteroids or other planets using the same types of gravitational anomaly detection. Yeah, and, and so you're just saying, Russ, you were highlighting that also magnetometry is involved with like better understanding and sensing these things. Yeah, and, and you so probably want both information that. as well for, you know, that, that would give you, you know, if, you, if you're looking for ore, a combination of gravitational and magnetic sensors would be fantastic for that. Um, last question, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe either of you could go for it. Um, isn't this, as in capital C-A-L, Cal Lab, a quantum sensor? Have I either of you heard of that particular? Are you, are you talking about the uh, ISS, the International Space Station? That's Beckel, I think. Yes. Okay. Is that a quantum sensor is the question? Um, I don't think it currently is, but it was certainly designed so it could do quantum sensing. Um, okay. Uh, I think they're working on it. Uh, that's that's a, an amazing experiment, incidentally. Um, it's yeah, that, that's um, we, we definitely view that as the platform of quantum sensing. It's a um, it's a capability demonstrator. Um, as a as a dedicated sensor, it has done a huge amount in um, pioneering um, the way towards um, dedicated space based um, constellations of sensors. Excellent. Well, as we've been building up with these answers, we're going to move on to the next section. We'll hear more about how quantum control can help your quantum sensors and also how our software here at Q-Control can help. ...and how they can give new capabilities in navigation and geospatial intelligence. 
I'll now discuss how quantum control is essential for realizing the true potential of quantum atomic sensors, and how Q-Control can help you harness this potential. All quantum sensors come from laboratory research, where they hold records for sensing magnetic and gravitational fields, and they're stable in these laboratory conditions over really long periods of time. Were we able to harness this sensitivity and stability outside the lab, we could detect smaller magnetic anomalies and harden targets from greater distances, and navigate more precisely, more reliably, and for longer. However, there are severe challenges in achieving this record-setting performance out of the lab, in realistic environments and with small form factors. In quantum sensors based on the interaction between atoms and light, degrading effects include the Doppler shift from different atomic velocities, phase noise on the lasers used to control the atoms, and the mechanical vibration inherent to moving vehicles. These challenges stand in the way for those of you seeking to take advantage of the promise of quantum sensors in real environments. Q-Control's technology can suppress these degradations to make quantum sensors more performant and even more functional in real-world conditions. One way to proceed is to try to improve the hardware alone, to add shielding, to make it more mechanically robust, but an alternative approach puts software first. We call this software-defined quantum hardware. It empowers your quantum centers to be reconfigurable, autonomous, and capable of learning about its own environment. And it can filter out unwanted clutter in noisy environments to hone in on a signal of interest. This allows you to extract more and more useful information from your quantum sensor, leveraging improvements at the software layer alone. The core of this approach is quantum control, which is predicated on three activities. In system identification, you can learn about the model of your device, including identifying the Hamiltonian, its dynamics and noise processes. Control design is where you can use machine learning and closed loop automated optimization to engineer light atom interactions that improve the quality of your quantum sensor, such as the atomic source uh, or the fidelity of the state preparation. Finally, performance verification is actually testing these design precepts out in a simulation that reflects real world conditions and real world noise sources. Of course, these three activities are not distinct. There's a reciprocity between them, which is the foundation of quantum control. This is the typical protocol for most quantum sensors, and quantum control can help to improve every step. In quantum sensing, all three activities of system identification, control design, and performance verification in concert can unlock adaptive, self-certifying, and autonomous quantum sensing where unanticipated changes to the signal and environment are identified and accounted for in real time. This can be accomplished without a fundamental change in the underlying hardware, the very heart of software-defined quantum hardware. For example, the quantum control solutions we've been talking about can enhance state preparation using machine learning during the initialization step. It can help combat dominant sources of failure with robust controls during transformation steps like atom optical mirrors, it can improve the sensitivity in a minimum space-time area during the evolution step, and optimize state readout and signal filtering during measurement and feedback steps. Finally, data fusion can deliver more information from hybrid quantum and classical sensors. Let's be concrete, using the example of atom interferometry, where a cloud of atoms falls through a laser beam to make precise measurements of acceleration. Put simply, they do this by perceiving the standing wave of a laser as an optical ruler falling a discernible distance in a well-known time. This device follows the exact quantum sensing protocol we saw on the previous slide. During the initialization step, a pi over two laser pulse creates a superposition of two atomic states moving apart from each other. During the evolution step, the trajectories in this superposition diverge in a way that depends on the acceleration that we're trying to measure. During the transformation step, a pi laser pulse acts as a mirror for the atoms switching the velocities of the two trajectories so they move back towards each other. And finally, during the measurement step, the third laser pulse converts the evolution into something we can measure on a detector, in this case, the number of atoms in each state of the superposition. The signal we get out is an interference fringe, a wave. It's the number of atoms we count in a certain atomic trajectory after the sequence of laser pulses. We can determine the acceleration from this signal with great precision, in a way that depends on the number of atoms in the cloud n, the laser wavelength lambda, the time the atoms fell t, 
and the amplitude of the signal we measure at the detector, V. But there are two main problems that jeopardize taking this precise measurement of acceleration from the lab into a real world environment. The first is that when we drop the cloud of atoms, those with different initial velocities will perceive the laser beam to have a slightly different frequency. You might know this as the Doppler shift. A faster falling atom will see the laser more red shifted than a slower falling atom, and it will perceive the ruler lines of the standing wave to be spaced further apart. If different atoms in the cloud disagree on the spacing of the ruler lines, this degrades the quality of that optical ruler, washing out the atomic interference pattern substantially. The second problem is that the platform the entire quantum sensor is on in the field is usually shaking. That's okay if it's shaking up and down, this is the direction along which we want to measure accelerations in the first place. But what if the platform is shaking horizontally? As you can see here, an atom falling straight down will move in and out of the laser beam. So what the falling atom sees is a noisy laser amplitude rather than a constant intensity. This is a fundamental challenge whenever we try to deploy a quantum sensor in a real environment. It leads to massive performance degradations, up to a thousand times from the best recorded lab performance. We can visualize these problems by looking at what the pulses of light do to the atomic quantum state. The canonical way to do this is with the spin vector, which we draw on the block sphere. The middle of these three pulses should act to mirror the spin vector from one side of the equator to the other, aiming for the target state shown in grey. This is the example of a pi, or mirror pulse, which should ideally mirror the spin vector about the xz plane, in this case, mapping the spin pointing along the y direction to a spin pointing along the minus y direction, as we see in the animation on the left. In the animation on the right, we've incorporated the two main systematic errors, different atomic velocities that cause laser frequency noise, and a moving platform that causes laser amplitude noise. Under these conditions, conventional pulses that simply turn the laser beam on and off lose control of the atomic spin and miss the target state. But the light atom interaction permits far more control than merely turning the laser beam on and off once per pulse. If we instead modulate the amplitude, phase and frequency of the laser beam during the pulses in a careful way, we can enact new kinds of quantum control, just like in quantum computing. The pulses shown here were derived using the optimization tools in Boulder Opal, and were engineered to be robust to the frequency and amplitude error inherent to these two key problems. Looking at the real world scenario of the previous slide, the robust pulse takes the atomic spin vector and correctly maps it to the target state, even under imperfect conditions. Frequency errors cause the spin to diverge away from the desired trajectory in a direction that depends on which hemisphere it's in. Unlike the conventional on-off pulse, modulating the laser rapidly causes the spin to spend an equal amount of time in each hemisphere, cancelling these oppositely directed divergences. In the performance verification step, we validate the effect of replacing the conventional laser pulses with noise-robust optimised pulses. By simulating the entire measurement protocol under the real-world conditions that include the atomic velocity spread and the platform vibration. Here we can visualise the immunity of these controls on a performance landscape that spans two dimensions of dominant error. You can see that the robust optimised pulses remain performant over a much larger range of atomic velocities and platform-induced laser amplitude noise. A key measure of the sensitivity to accelerations is the amplitude of the sensor output. The 10 times larger signal we get here using robust optimised pulses are one way that you can get massive gains in sensitivity under real world conditions using quantum control. On our documentation website, you can find application notes showcasing the results of this and other quantum sensing challenges that you can solve using Boulder Opal. Unlike static documentation, you can interact with and execute Python notebooks in your browser. This allows you to explore how to apply quantum control precepts available via Boulder Opal to your own challenges in translating quantum technology out of the lab and into the field. You can take advantage of many other quantum control solutions for extracting more and more useful information from your quantum sensors, including cold start automation, AI enhanced signal tracking and reconstruction, band limited control and sensitivity, and the ability to simulate in real world conditions. These are all available in Boulder Opal. There are plenty of opportunities for you to join our team of experts who hold world records in multiple quantum sensing domains, 
expanding fundamental laboratory research to quantum technology translation. If you're looking to help build the next generation of quantum sensing solutions with a background in quantum atomic devices, optomechanics, or embedded systems, we'd love you to join us. Please get in touch using the link that we'll share after the webinar. Thanks for coming along today. And welcome back again. So that was, let me bring up some questions. We had a few that came through. Um, first question that I wanted to answer was, um, what is the working temperature of a sensor in space? This question to Russ. Yeah, so um, space presents a huge number of challenges for um, ruggedizing any technology um, and from material fatigue and massive thermal gradients. And this is something that any um, space qualification undertaking must, um, must accomplish and quantum tech is no exception to that. Uh, so there are some unique challenges to do with um, the fact that you need to often look into a vacuum chamber. Uh, so glass blackening is another maybe ex exotic example of um, difficult challenges for, for space qualification of quantum tech, but that, that's an active area of pursuit. Yeah. Um, we have another question. How do you check whether the sensor is behaving in a quantum way during an experiment? Do you see the need uh, of documenting standards or guidelines to assist the development of technology for applications? Yeah, so um, uh, as you just uh, heard from me, actually, the online calibration and automatic optimization is something that um, uh, quantum control can certainly uh, contribute to. And the solutions you heard about are, are a path towards that um, online uh, self-calibrating and also self-certifying quantum sensing. Um, standards are important in any industry. Um, quantum tech is, again, no exception. Um, the Quantum Economic Development Consortium in the US, of which we're a member, is a strong advocate, um, advocating body for these standards. Uh, it's a great question. And, and I'd say that um, these fundamental techniques of quantum control um, in both developing benchmarks and um, doing online calibration have been uh, validated by our team uh, in the lab using quantum computing hardware with cold atoms. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, so the next, next question is related to that, which uh, is, are these optimization techniques based on machine learning using training sets, or are they based on model-based techniques or Bayesian methods? I'm uh, the okay. best person to answer yeah, that. Maybe you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the machine learning techniques with regard to the state preparation, um, just to be really clear, yeah, they're not, they're not, they're model-free, and they don't use previous data. They're actually based on um, optimization techniques directly from the experiment. The ones which were used for state preparation uh, can be using Bayesian methods, but we also have techniques with um, reinforcement learning, and that's all available right now in Boulder Opal. So you can jump in and have a go. Um, that's some of the answer. I don't know, Russ, did you want to add to that as well? Uh, all I'd say is again, um, those some of those machine learning techniques, um, the Gaussian processes and um, black box automated optimization have been validated using cold atoms in the lab. Yeah. Uh, so we think they're very promising for um, for getting quantum sensors in the field. Yeah, excellent. Um, another question. I found the GPS example in the intro slides very fascinating. Could you explain a bit further on the mathematical process of going from quantum sensing or computing to how that could be implemented for optimizing problems or finding the fastest route to your destination? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a really interesting question. Uh, that's not, uh, I don't know whether Boulder could be used to do something like that. Do you know? <laughs> no, so maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, yeah, I guess it was an interesting point to differentiate. So um, the improving the quality of your senses, right? So improving the quality of your ability to locate and things definitely has an implication for uh, improving things like routing and figuring out where you can get. Um, I would highlight that that's actually within Q control. that's a separate effort. So we do also have an effort looking at um, improving the routing as a, like a particular example with quantum computing. Um, and there are kind of really interesting opportunities. So I don't know if we can give you a concrete answer today, but there are really interesting opportunities about uh, combining quantum sensing and quantum computing to improve routing as you're both improving the location of where you are. And then there's possibilities with like quantum computing to figure out the best way to go. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of interesting opportunities there. But certainly what we were talking about here um, was actually about sort of navigation specifically and how we could use quantum sensing to navigate without GPS. Yes, yeah. And so that's that's the specific concept that we're getting across today, yeah. Um, another question, cold atom atomic fountain clocks operate close to the theoretical limit of performance. Have any inertial sensors done that? Yeah, so um, the, the same kind of atomic devices 
uh, in the lab have been used to get to the fundamental limits of inertial sensing. And those fundamental limits are based on the quantum physics of the atomic source. Uh, you can take those devices and put them in the field. Again, you, you often take a performance hit of up to a thousand. There are uh, fielded inertial sensors um, that get close to the quantum limits, um, but really extracting the true potential of those um, sensors in a, in a rugged way uh, is gonna benefit from quantum control. Yeah, for sure. Um, another good question, are quantum sensors already in space? Uh, no, I think. Um, the, close, the closest would be, as we we're talking about earlier, the International Space Station effort. Um, actually, perhaps the closest is the sounding rocket experiment, which I guess briefly went into space and did a quantum sensing experiment for a couple of minutes. Hmm. Um, there, was an, there was also a question earlier um, in, the, in the text chat about um, whether atomic clocks can be considered quantum sensors. Yeah, um, yeah. some, that's a great question. Uh, semantically, they are often um, thought of as a quantum sensor because they are the physics of atomic clocks is at the core of literally every quantum sensor based on atomic superposition and interference. Um, however, we take um, a sort of uh, modern view that quantum sensing is of forces and fields, uh, even if the same um, salient physics is that of an atomic clock. Obviously, atomic clocks are in space. Uh, so uh, as a small nuance. Mm. Yeah, but I, I'd say, I just highlight like there's, there's big challenges of getting things into space because it's such a noisy environment, right? So hopefully the quantum control techniques that we're developing at Q-Control will really assist in pushing sensors into that frontier. Absolutely, um, and, we, and we really intend to be, you know, the first hopefully to operate an autonomous atomic sensor in space. Yeah. Uh, that's the goal. Um, is there any inertial navigation software currently available? Another question from Carl Yar. Uh, there, I think there is some open source inertial navigation software, uh, but I believe that most of it is proprietary. Uh, so for example, our partner Advanced Navigation has their own uh, navigation software, which they certainly hold close. Um, it's very good. Yeah, yeah, that's good answer. So um, is there a difference between an atomic sensor, like an atomic vapor cell versus a cold atom quantum sensor um, that uses Rabi oscillations? Yes and no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, 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 add any color to that? No, okay. no sorry. Uh, I'll just say, so obviously there's a difference in temperature. Um, so cold atoms being cold, they have uh, their quantum mechanical properties, if you like, are strong, stronger, uh, as in their coherence time is longer. Uh, but that being said, both devices use placing atoms into a superposition and mm. using that superposition to make a precise measurement of a physical quantity you care about. So at a fundamental physics level, no, they are both operating on the same matter wave interference principle. Um, next question, have the products of quantum sensors been integrated into the real application systems to test their performance? So have, uh, have quantum sensors been integrated into the real, real applications we've discussed, I guess is the question. Uh, so there are some demonstrations of um, hybrid navigation with classical and quantum uh, detectors in the uh, academic literature. Yeah. Um, actually turning that into a product or um, something which has sort of reached a high level of technology readiness, um, those hybrid sensors are, are still actively being developed. Um, I think we've got time for one more question um, about one of these new exciting developments. So. The creation of a time crystal was just announced. Do you have any insights on this? How would a time crystal change the quantum sensing technologies? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, okay I, I personally have very little uh, experience working with time crystals. So I would not feel comfortable uh, commenting directly on that. Mm. Um, I think the only comment that I would make there is that um, time crystals are realized in cold atom systems. And so a lot of the technology with regard to improving the way in which we control and trap cold atoms is like relevant to quantum sensing. But um, the specific physics of a time crystal, yeah, isn't not necessarily directly related, but that might be an interesting avenue of research. If you're interested in researching that, please come talk to us. I'm sure we can use Bold Oracle to help you with your simulation needs. Yeah, I mean, um, I imagine you could use it to optimize um, the creation of time crystals in cold atom systems, certainly. Yeah. Um, then I think we'll just, one more question more related to, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll frame it more around the sensing side. So um, 
there in, in terms of quantum computing, there are a lot of different types of uh, designs and uh, competing platforms on NV centers, superconducting qubits, et cetera. So I guess the question is, um, are there any competitors for quantum sensing about what we're looking at um, and what do they look like? Could you give it like a bit of an overview? Yeah, so uh, they're great examples of different platforms for both um, quantum sensing and quantum computing. Yes, um, <laughs> we, we don't see them as um, competitors, we see them as, as complementary. Uh, and indeed our team has experience in uh, developing theoretical and experimental uh, capability and solutions in, in all those platforms. So we have experience in NV centers and superconducting qubits and diamond. And um, the solutions you've heard about today are applicable to all of those domains. Yeah, I, th I think the only thing I would like to add is I think the particular strength of cold atom sensors is in their long-term stability. I think uh, other sensors, I think it would be challenging to offer that. Um, no, I mean, never say never, uh, because they are, they are quantum systems, you could come up with a way of exploiting um, the particular properties of quantum system to reach that long-term stability. But at the moment, that's the thing that I think is uniquely offered by cold atom sensors. Um, okay, two more questions and then we'll call it uh, a day. So first is, how does quantum sensing help with more efficient use of the RF spectrum? Uh, actually, quantum sensing is... Um, I'm going to flip that around a little bit and say that um, quantum sensing is actually a great way of detecting uh, signals in the RS spectrum, including for um, things like quantum communication. Uh, so there's heaps of applications um, which include um, undersea detection and communication that, that might benefit from uh, quantum sensing in that in that part of the spectrum. And then the final question, I think, is definitely for you, Russ. Um, what what kinds of position are available at Q Control? Oh, so glad you asked. Uh, we are currently uh, looking for, for more um, uh, quantum sensing engineers. And more broadly, we're, we're expanding to, um, to start hiring uh, design capable engineers in um, traditional disciplines such as uh, digital electronics, FPGAs, uh, embedded systems, um, and electrical engineering as well. Yeah. And I guess that's a, like a really exciting opportunity. So if you're interested in the quantum industry, but your background's not precisely quantum, um, joining us at Q-Control can be a really good opportunity. We've certainly had people join us from machine learning backgrounds and moved a bit into the quantum field. So yeah, come contact us if you have the skills that are relevant to what we're trying to do. And if you're really interested in mm -hmm. making quantum, te quantum technologies real, right? I'd say um, please, please uh, keep track of our, our career site. Yeah, yeah um, at some point. It's, it's very prominent on our on our webpage, qcontrol.com. Yeah. And um, yeah, check check back if you haven't found an opportunity that's right for you or just get in touch with us. Excellent. Um, yeah, so thanks again, everybody. Uh, when you finish, there'll be an opportunity to give us a, a survey, like there'll be a link sent to you. Um, please fill out, that web, uh, web, fill, fill out that survey. It helps us um, better know how to improve these webinars. And also it puts you in a chance for getting a $50 voucher. So I would really appreciate it. And if you want to chat to us, simply go to the website and hit, um, hit that contact us, or you'll also get a link in the um, emails that come up after this webinar. So, okay. So thank you again. And um, hopefully I'll see you all at the next webinar presented by Q Control. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all.